Hello everyone, this is Hannah Fraser, Entomologist for Porticulture with OMAFRA. Today's presentation is Introductory Entomology for IPM Scout Training. Today's presentation is intended to provide a basic overview of some important concepts about entomology to help prepare you for upcoming prop-specific sessions. Entomology is the study of insects and it is a branch of zoology. We often think of insects as pests when we are talking about agricultural entomology, but of course most insects that are out there that you are going to encounter are beneficial or they're just in the crop. They're not necessarily causing crop injury. So we'll be covering some really basic information like why scout for insects in the first place? What does that uh, provide us with? What information can we relay to the growers that we're working with uh, through scouting for insects? We're going to cover some foundational concepts like basic structures, growth and development, mouth parts and types of injury. We're also going to cover a few of the orders of economic importance in agriculture. And we'll end with a walk in the orchard so that you can meet a few key member, uh, key families from these orders so that you'll be a little bit more familiar with them when you take uh, the sessions over the next few weeks. Insects have actually existed for over 400 million years. Uh, they're the most numerous group of animals. Um, about 66% of all animal species are insects. There have been 1.3 million species described so far, probably more since I looked this up, this figure up. And of course, there's many more that haven't been described yet. They uh, there can be a huge number of in individuals per unit area, and I have a little uh, slide there that I uh, picture there that I pulled from Google, and I wish I'd made it a little bit bigger. But essentially, what it covers is it it's talking about um, locusts and migratory locusts um, in Africa, and of course, these can be present in absolutely huge numbers per unit area, and when they're on the move, they're and they're hungry, they can consume a vast quantity of uh, of food that is destined for um, for humans um, and uh, and animals, so they can be um, they can be really really numerous. Um, one of the things um, with insects is that they are extremely adaptable. They occupy wide ranges of ecological habitats. They have a huge diversity of form and function. They have what is called uh, an exoskeleton, and that is very uh, protective uh, for them. We'll talk about that a little bit more in a moment. They're generally a uh, small in size, um, so they take a minimal uh, amount of resources for growth and reproduction. And they reproduce pretty quickly. Um, they can have very high fecundity and they have different modes of reproduction. They are also able to fly, which means that the adult forms can move to new locations when conditions uh, are no longer favorable or they're looking for new hosts or places to lay their eggs or places to overwinter. They also have amazing uh, behavioral adaptations and they're able to construct protective structures around them. So this is one of the reasons why uh, insects are really, really a dominant force on this planet. In terms of the damage that they can cause, um, they are exploiters of virtually all organic matter found almost everywhere, in, important um, in many, in really all parts of ecosystems, and they're vital to food supply chains. In terms of injury, herbivorous damage from insects is about 18% in terms of world agricultural production. But keep in mind from that, that less than 0.5% of the species are actually pests. One of the adaptations insects ha have is the ability to avoid less favorable conditions through diapause. What is diapause? It's important that you understand what this is because it's a term you are going to hear a lot during training sessions as it relates to overwintering success in Ontario. Basically diapause in temperate regions is a seasonal dormancy that is adapted to recurring periods of adverse environmental environmental conditions, and it's triggered by both biotic and abiotic factors that precede the arrival of these conditions. It's a mechanism to survive predictable, unfavorable environmental conditions, which means it's induced. Once diapause is induced in an insect, there's only certain stimuli, and often that's photoperiod, which are capable of bringing the insect out of diapause. Typically, it's a certain life stage that will enter diapause to overwinter in Ontario and in other temperate regions. 
It's also, diapause is really important in determining voltanism, which it relates to the number of generations that we see uh, here in temperate climates like Ontario. And it can be obligate or facultative depending on the species. So for example, European corn borer, which is a pest you will hear about in corn and possibly some other crops, um, can have either univoltine or bivoltine ecotypes, which means depending on the ecotype, it might have one generation per year, or it might be capable of multiple generations per year. So it, gen it, it is important in terms of the number of broods or generations an organism um, has. Insect migration is another adaptation. One of the most famous examples of migration in insects is the seasonal movement of monarch butterflies from the overwintering locations in Mexico northwards and the return flight, which occurs over several generations each year. So it's that seasonal movement of insects to escape current or pending environmental conditions that are not going to allow it to survive or to breed. Many crops, crop pests that we have overwinter in lower latitudes and they migrate polewards in the spring to colonize abundant but temporary uh, things like agricultural hosts. Spring migration is often wind aided and it can result in very rapid transportation, hundreds of kilometers in only a few days. So what can happen is you might be scouting a, a crop and not see a pest and come back the next week and you might see lots of that pest. And that is what happens when essentially these wind aided systems dump pests into our area. This is again one of the things that's not predictable, so you need to be scouting for it. So basically, um, one of the one really another good example from an agricultural pest uh, standpoint is black cutworm. It does not overwinter in Ontario, but along the Gulf Coast, and it migrates northwards in the spring on these low-level wind jets. And again, there's that whole um, we don't know when they're going to arrive, and so it's important to uh, try and scout for them. And we do this through the use of pheromone traps. So I have another presentation as part of this series that talks about making traps work and we'll cover pheromone traps um, in, that, um, in that session. Insects have really both positive and I guess negative uh, aspects to them. From the standpoint of crop production, when we worry about damage or injury, it's things like uh, the feeding that occurs on the plant that causes it to be damaged or kills. It affects the plant health and it can affect the portion of the crop that we're interested in harvesting. So it can, that, that results in crop loss for the growers. Um, insects can also result in loss of food in storage. And although this is not likely something that you are likely to engage in this summer, it's important to, to recognize that this can be quite significant. Insects are also capable of transmitting diseases to animals, including humans. And that, of course, can cause irritation. They can vector plant diseases. They can cause contamination of the crop at harvest. They can cause structural damage. And they can be a general nuisance. But some of the positive elements are that they provide ecosystem services like pollination. Many of, the many of the foods that we enjoy are the result of pollination by insects. They can also help to regulate populations of plant pests, uh, including uh, other insects or weeds. And we talk a lot about natural enemies and biological control. So that's a really important ecological service. They can also provide us with natural fibers like wax and silk. And of course, we, we love honey. Many of us love honey. Um, insects themselves are also an important food source, perhaps not here in North America, but they are in other parts of the world. They're also in incredibly important from the standpoint of medicine and research. And of course, insects in art and culture date back thousands of years. So again, there's lots of, uh, you know, we, we think a lot about the, the pest status of insects, but it's so important to realize that they're, they're much more than that. So why monitor for insects? Well, if you monitor for insects, you're going to know what's there. You can't just stand outside of your, your car, your vehicle that you're using to go to your field sites and um, I guess imagine what's there. You need to actually get out and scout. So scouting tells you who's in the crop and that includes both pests and beneficial insects. It can also, give you provi it can also provide you with information on popula population levels and trends. 
So with insects, unlike perhaps diseases, it's often a numbers game. So there are certain thresholds. Um, you can tolerate insects to a certain, some pests to a certain uh, level um, without treating them. Um, in some cases, the threshold is zero. Um, but if you're not out there looking for them, you won't know. So it does get information on, on what's out there and how many are out there and the trends. It can also tell you what life stages are present. And this is actually really important because only certain life stages may be exposed um, or susceptible to the controls that are used against them. So you do need to recognize what life stages are present. And it also tells you about potential hotspots in the field. So some pests are present, they're border pests, and that's if they're present in those border regions and the growers know that they're just in those regions, they can treat those hotspots exclusively and save themselves some money. It can also tell you if there's new or unusual pests. Perhaps there is something unusual that's showing up and you need to be able to recognize that. As a follow-up, uh, scouting can give you an idea of how well the grower's IPM practices are. So if they have uh, applied a pest control product one week and you go back the next week to check, hopefully the numbers um, have been reduced. So again, the monitoring for insects give you, gives you an idea of the diversity uh, the, and the abundance of insects and it's a great surveillance tool as well. I won't have much time to cover beneficial insects in this presentation, but it's important to recognize that the vast majority of insects are not crop pests. There are many predators and parasitoids that help keep pest populations in check, though not always at levels that provide sufficient control. In Ontario, for example, biological control is, is a key way that pest species are managed in greenhouse operations, a practice that came about largely because of the development of resistance of pests like thrips. On this slide here, I'm just um, illustrating a few of the common pests that you might see um, when you're out there scouting. Some of these include lady beetles, like this uh, insect in the top uh, left-hand corner that is a, a great predator for aphids. Um, this middle picture here shows a parasitoid of the tarnished plant bug, and it is attacking one of the uh, nymphs um, in that photo. On the top right here is a parasitic fly that parasitizes leaf roller species. You can see the pupil case of the leaf roller species and then the pupil case of the fly and then the fly that has emerged. Down here on the lower uh, left hand side, um, this uh, fly here has been affected by Bovaria bassiana, which is a, a fungi, uh, not, um, not an insect, but it is definitely uh, beneficial. And you might sometimes find uh, insects that are affected like that out in fields. Um, in the middle bottom here, this um, wax moth larva has been attacked by uh, entomopathogenic nematodes, um, which, uh, which kill, uh, kill the insects. And then finally, on the bottom right, this little fellow here is a little a tiny stink bug nymph. And as you can see, it has captured uh, a much larger larva, which it has killed and is feeding on. Okay, so I can't talk about entomology without at least some taxonomy. Uh, basically, insects, mites, centipedes, millipedes, and crustaceans are all arthropods. So they are all animals, so they're part of the animal kingdom, but they're also part of the, the phylum arthropoda. And what is that? Well, it means that all of these animals have these jointed limbs and jointed mouth parts with extensive specializations. They also have segmented bodies with paired appendages, and this gives them flexibility of movement. Um, so you think about, uh, think about all the different limbs that you see on insects and spiders and the different ways that they bend. Well, that's actually very important um, from the standpoint of locomotion. They also have an external skeleton of chitin. Chitin is incredibly strong. It helps to protect them against desiccation and mechanical injury. I won't have much time going over chitin, but knowledge about the structure and function of chitin has been really important in the development of insecticides that are able to penetrate or have an effect on the protective insect skeleton. Within the phylum arthropoda, there are five subphyla. The myriapoda, which are centipedes and millipedes, and I highlight in yellow, um, where there are pests that you might occasionally um, uh, 
find in agricultural systems. There are also uh, crustaceans like shrimp, lobster, crabs, and crayfish. The Chilis errata, which includes spiders, scorpion, horseshoe crabs, and mites, which again can be um, either, well, they can be friends or foes. The hexapoda, which are insects, springtails, and bristletails, and the extinct trilobites. Now, hexapoda is highlighted here because it does have insects. And hexapoda, well, of course, they have uh, six legs. Now, I don't have time to go over the internal anatomy of insects, but unlike us, they have an open circulatory system um, with a multitude of breathing tubes or openings in the exoskeleton called spiracles. And they have nerve centers that process information in the brain and elsewhere in the body. And this ability, uh, the ability to fly, of course, makes insects unique among arthropods. This allows them to move between environments, move over distances, escape predators, etc. Insects have three body regions, the head, the thorax, and the abdomen. The head has a pair of antennae, which are highly varied in form that provide all sorts of sensory information. It also has a pair of compound and sim simple eyes. Simple eyes or ocelli are important for sensing light and dark, and compound eyes are used for detecting movement, light, etc. Legs and wings are also present on the thorax, which is actually divided into three sections. Each section has a pair of legs. Insects can have one, two, or no pairs of wings as adults. The abdomen is where the reproductive and digestive organs are located, and of course the sense organs of insects are scattered on different parts of the body. I wanted to get back to mites. Now, remember, mites are not insects, they're from a different subphylum. Mites have two body regions, the cephalothorax and the abdomen. Now, the cephalothorax is essentially a head and a thorax that are fused into one. When you look at a mite, though, it's often difficult to see any distinct uh, body regions whatsoever. Mites are part of the class Arachnida. Remember, insects are Insecta, mites are Arachnida, and they're from the subclass Acari. They have pincer-like mouth parts or piercing sucking type. They have simple eyes, so no compound eyes. They lack antenna, they lack wings. The adults have four pairs of legs instead of three pairs of legs, and the body is not divided into these distinct regions. Note that ticks and chiggers, which you might encounter occasionally when you're out scouting and you need to look for, um, are also part of this group. And I highlight here, this is a, a, a bee pupa, and on the bee pupa is a, a varroa mite, which is a very serious pest um, of bees. When we hear the term metamorphosis, we often think of the classic monarch butterfly that goes from an egg to a larva or a caterpillar to a pupa and then emerges as a completely different looking creature, uh, a butterfly. Winged insects go through distinct stages of development before they become adults, and this is really what the term metamorphosis uh, refers to. Insects grow through a number of successive instars. Each is terminated by molt and ecdysis. So they basically break out of their old cuticle and they develop a new one. And each time they do that, they're, they're able to grow a little bit more. So um, this slide down, or this picture down here, just shows um, the development um, of an insect. And you can see that it's, it starts out quite small and it gets bigger and bigger each time it, it molts, it feeds and it grows, it feeds and grows and molts. And the molts um, are uh, regulated by um, hormones, by these juvenile hormones. And the, the amount of the juvenile hormone essentially triggers um, a molt that results in a new immature or it results in another form like either a pupa or an adult. So again, um, it is regulated by hormones. One of the things that um, I hear a lot is, oh, it's a baby beetle. <laughs> um, when they're looking at small beetles and comparing them to things that may look similar but larger, big beetles don't become bigger. Once the adult stage um, occurs, any changes that, can, that, that might occur in that insect are related to reproductive maturation. They don't actually get any bigger once they have become adults. Temperature is a major driver in the rate of development, uh, growth and development, so ambient temper. And this is because insects are cold-blooded. Now, each species has a temperature, a temperature um, below, with, 
below which no growth uh, occurs. And knowledge of the species rate of development in response to temperature can give us a very powerful term, tool in terms of uh, being able to predict emergence, peak activity, egg laying, and other events that are occurring um, in that insect uh, population. Um, you'll hear the term degree day models, and degree day models use daily maximum and minimum temperatures to help predict um, where an insect population, or where an insect population might be. Are they beginning to emerge? Are they laying their eggs, etc. Um, and I've given an example here of European red mite. This is a um, a species that um, the development is highly sensitive to temperature. So at low temperatures, it takes quite a long time to go from an egg to an adult, about 40, 40 days at 13 degrees C. But as the temperature increases, that developmental time really decreases. And so when you're looking at summer temperatures like uh, 24, 27 degrees, which we do experience in Ontario, certainly doesn't feel like it today, but <laughs> um, the development can occur very quickly. So you can have populations uh, building up really, really quickly from one week to the next when you're scouting. So just be aware of that. Now, I wanted to talk a little bit about the different types of development um, or metamorphosis that occur in, I guess, insects and their allies. <laughs> um, there, I wanted to talk a little bit about this incomplete metamorphosis, which is also called ametaboly, because it does apply to mites. It doesn't apply to insects. Um, and the reason is, is that this incomplete metamorphosis doesn't really have a major transformation. So there's no real changes from the immature to the adult forms. They look, the immatures do actually look like small adults. Um, they, in these, uh, in this group, the, they start out as eggs. The eggs hatch to become larvae. Then they undergo a molt and they become nymphs and there are multiple molts and we refer to them as nymphs and then you see the adult form. The larval stage has three pairs of legs and then later stages have four pairs of legs usually, so the nymphs and the adults. And I say usually because there are some species of nymphs that don't have four pairs of legs and these are just some examples that you're, um, you're likely to, um, to encounter. The next form of uh, metamorphosis or hemimetaboly is really relevant to our discussions um, because um, insects either have gradual or complete metamorphosis. So there is a major transformational change when at least when they develop wings. So in gradual metamorphosis, you have adults and nymphs that look very similar, um, except that the nymphs don't have um, wings. They may have little wing pads that grow at, on the outside of the body um, before they become uh, adults. Um, however, there is an abrupt change in the last molt, which is a metamorphic molt, when the last nymphal stage transforms into the adult with wings. So if they have that single sort of metamorphic molt, um, it's this gradual metamorphosis. And some examples are grasshoppers and plant bugs, leaf hoppers and aphids, and we'll meet some of those um, later on. Moran marmorated stink bug is a great example of an insect that undergoes gradual metamorphosis. This insect starts out as an egg, and actually the female lays uh, multiple egg masses. Each egg mass has roughly between 20 and 25 eggs within it. Those eggs hatch out and those the first little instar nymphs that you can see they're hanging out on that egg mass and they will stay on that egg mass and they'll feed on what's left in the uh, egg contents and then they'll disperse and they will gradually develop as you can see they look very similar to the adult they're smaller they're kind of shield shaped like the adult um, and in the fifth instar a nymph, you can start to see those little wind, wing buds forming, and then you will have the adult. So that is, uh, again, a good example of an insect that undergoes gradual metamorphosis. And then last but not least, we have complete metamorphosis, um, where there are two transformational changes that occur. Um, the first is when the larva molts to a pupal stage, which is essentially usually kind of like a dormant stage. They don't really move very much, <laughs> if at all. Um, and then there is a second uh, metamorphic change molt when they uh, molt to, uh, to adulthood. In complete metamorphosis, um, the wings develop inside the body. Um, the, again, the, the major changes between larval and pupil and pupil and adult, the pupa, pupal stage is the transitional change. 
And one of the things that's quite interesting is that the feeding habits and even the host plants can differ between the life stages. There are some adults without mouth parts and they really vestigial mouth parts and they, they don't feed at all. So when you think of complete metamorphosis, it's flies, bees, beetles, butterflies, um, all undergo that type of metamorphosis. And here is just a picture of, um, these are actually wire worms, which are a significant uh, pest um, for things like tubers. Um, see, uh, they will attack seeds as well. Uh, the female will lay her eggs, those eggs will hatch, the little wire worms will feed on the roots of the plants and the tubers, um, and they will pupate in the soil, and then the adults come out. The adults are often not uh, problematic, they're click beetles, um, but it's the larval stage that does cause um, the problems here. And, and one of the things with wire worms, as you'll learn, is that when you have wireworms in the field, many of them take many years to develop. So if you have a lot of wireworms in the field, it can be kind of a long-term uh, problem for the grower to actually have to deal with. Insects that undergo complete metamorphosis have really varied larval types. There are three basic forms of them, and I just want to go over them here because it will help you when you're out there scouting to figure out what you might actually be looking at. The first group it is the oligopods, and this, these types of larvae have very well-developed thoracic legs and well-developed head capsules. They can have, within that group, elongated legs, they can be very active, like many of the predators, lady beetles, lace wings, lace wings and ground beetles. They can have little short legs and C-shaped bodies, like grubs, or they can be elongated and cylindrical with really tough skin, like the wireworms we met earlier. Then there's the polypods, and they have very well-developed thoracic legs, and they also have what are called abdominal prolegs. So you'll see them, they're like little false legs almost, but they do help in locomotion. Polypods can either have thoracic legs and six to nine pairs of abdominal prolegs, which we see in the sawflies, or they can have well-developed thoracic legs plus two to five pairs of abdominal prolegs, like we see in the Lepidoptera. The third group are the op 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 opodus uh, group that have no thoracic legs whatsoever. And these are well represented in the maggots, which their head is actually enclosed in the thorax. It's not even distinct at all. Or they can have a well-developed head like bees and round-headed beetles and mosquitoes. So those are the three uh, general larval types that you will encounter um, for the insects that undergo that complete metamorphosis. Insect mouth parts are, are an important taxonomic feature. They are highly modified, allowing insects to exploit many different types of resources, including location of feeding on the host. Mouth parts are the most important way in which insects inflict losses in, in injury, although oviposition is another. When you, when you look at the damage that's done by a crop feeding, it generally falls into several groups. There are insects that chew and bite. There are insects that pierce and suck. Others that rasp and suck. Then there's those that chew and lap, and those that siphon and sponge, and that cut and sponge. So there's a lot of variation. In terms of agricultural pests that we see, the, the major ones are either chewing, biting types, or they're piercing, sucking types, or they're rasping, sucking types. The others that are in this group are typically not associated with agricultural pests, at least in the feeding stage. Um, so when when I'm talking about groups later on, um, think about the type of way the mouth part moves and the type of injury that you might see on the plant because it's actually quite um, important and a, a really great clue. If you've already listened to the intro to pathology that my colleague put together for this series, you would have heard mention the, two, the term symptoms and signs. Symptoms in the context of insects are an expression of feeding or attack by an insect, whereas the signs are the living organisms themselves or their byproducts. Symptoms of insect attack are things like missing plant parts, clipped shoots or stems, die back of the plant, distortion of fruits and leaves or shoots, or the development of galls. Spots on the leaves or holes and tears are other symptoms that are quite common, especially with chewing insects. You might find discolored leaves or you might see sawdust and pitch for uh, situations where the insect has been excavating in something like woody tissue. Some of the signs that you will encounter are the insects or the mites themselves or their cast skins and their pupil cases, so when they are molting. 
They might also leave behind frass or insect excrement. And you will often find honeydew and sooty mold in association with pests like aphids. They, they do excrete honeydew in very large quantities. And as a result, you might also see ants in association with these aphid colonies because they do tend the ant, uh, aphids and they take honeydew in exchange. You might also see leaf shelters or cocoons or webbing present, or you may find galleries left for, behind from, uh, from feeding. So these are some of the symptoms and signs that you are likely to encounter. I have a few words about insect diet. So insects can be specialists or generalists, and this can apply both to the herbivores or the plant feeders, as well as the predators and the parasitoids that are out there. Monophagous insects are really specific in their diet. They are considered specialists, and they some of them will even have a single host. So a good example of that is Paracilla. It feeds in, on pear, and um, that's it. Then you can have those that are more broad in terms of their diet. They feed on related uh, genera. These are oligophagous species like the Colorado potato beetle that will feed on solanaceous plants, including potatoes, tomatoes, as well as the uh, nightshade, which is a weed. The last is the, the polyphagous ins, uh, feeders, and these are generalists. They will feed on unrelated hosts, basically whatever is in the fridge, uh, they will go for. And a good example of that is brown marmorated stink bug. And this type of uh, insect that has these broad generalists are, are often cross commodity pests. So you'll encounter the same pest in more than one crop. Also applies to oligophagus in so, to some extent. But these polyphagous ones are often cross commodity and we will sometimes call them landscape pests because you'll find them in all sorts of different contexts. Identification to species can be really easy or it can be really challenging depending on the insect at hand. If you show me a picture of a Colorado potato beetle, adult or larva, I'll be able to ID it even out of context. But not all IDs are that easy. It's really important uh, trying to get help um, to look at, you know, gathering insect pictures, things like that, but also what was it feeding on? What was the crop stage? Where was it on the host? What's the timing? as well as taxonomic features. So you're not gonna be doing any of that um, today, um, but it is, uh, it's, it's really, really important to try to get as close as you can with the IDs, uh, even when you're just trying to, to get help. There are 24 orders of insects in North America, most of which we can set aside when we're talking about those that are important to plant agriculture, either from a pest standpoint or from a beneficial standpoint. These are the hemipteroids, Orthopterans, Hymenopterans, Coleopterans, Lepidopterans, Dipterans, and the Physenoptera Thys or the Thrips. Um, just a note that the names of these um, different orders um, have a description of some really key features of those orders within the name itself. So Heteroptera, uh, which means half wing, describes what the wing structure is like in stink bugs and plant bugs. So Heteroptera are half wing. Homoptera, uniform wing, orthoptera, which are grasshoppers and crickets, straight wings, hymenoptera have membranous wings, coleoptera have sheath wings, lepidoptera have scaly wings, diptera have two wings, and thysanoptera have bristly wings. So we will talk about uh, each of these groups um, and uh, some of the other. The homopterans are a group of highly variable insects that include aphids, scales, leafhoppers, adelgids, psyllids, mealybugs, and others. Typically, the adults will have two pairs of membranous wings that are held in a roof-like position over their backs. In some cases, the adults lack, win lack wings. These insects have piercing, sucking mouth parts that are sometimes referred to as stylets. Think about a syringe or a straw. These insects use these stylets to pierce plants and to suck up the plant juices. The mouth parts arise from the back portion of the underside of the head. If you were to flip the insect over, it looks a little bit like it arises from between the legs. They are important vectors of several plant pathogens, and they may also secrete honeydew or other waxy secretions that you will notice when you're scouting before you even see the insects. The life stages here are eggs, nymphs, and adults. One of the interesting things with many homopterans is that they do reproduce asexually. And in some cases, they rep reproduce parthogenetically, which means the females give birth to live young. In these situations, you can see rapid increases of the pest uh, from one week to another under favorable conditions.
Heteroptera are considered the true bugs. They all have the name bug in their name. So stink bugs, plant bugs, mullein bugs, minute pyro bugs, etc. Those all have the word bug in it in the common name. In this group, the four wings, which are called the hemelytra, have a basal portion that's leathery and they have a distal portion that's membranous. So if you look at the picture on the right of this brown marmorated stink bug, you'll see the membranous portion as well as that leathery portion. They also have piercing sucking mouth parts. Um, in this case though, the, the beak arises from the front of the head. They can be plant feeders and predators or both. And the life stages here include egg, nymph and adult. So think of what type of uh, development that is. The next order that I wanted to cover are the Hymenoptera. And these include the bees, the ants, wasps, and sawflies. And in this group, you have a lot of beneficials, um, pollinators, predators, parasitoids, and others that are plant feeders. Uh, this group, they have chewing or chewing lapping mouth parts. The immatures have chewing mouth parts. The adults have two pairs of mem membranous wings, or they can be wingless and they have large compound eyes. They also have an ovipositor, which can be quite sharp for laying eggs or for sawing into tissues to lay their eggs. Several of them, like the bees, the ants, and the wasps have a slender waist. Think back to the types of development. This group undergoes the development that includes eggs, larvae, pupa, and adult. So that's complete metamorphosis. The Coleoptera, or beetles, is an extremely large and varied group. It includes scarab beetles, ground beetles, bark beetles, lady beetles, weevils, and many, many others. In fact, it is the largest order of insects. 40% of the species identified to date include beetles. Both the immatures and the adults have chewing mouth parts. The adults have two pairs of wings. The front wings are hard. These are called elytra. They're kind of modified and hardened and quite protective. These elytra meet in a straight line over the back of the insect. The hind wings, which are covered, are membranous. These can be predators and they can be herbivores. The life stages that we see within this group include egg, larva, pupa, and adult. So again, it is complete metamorphosis. I wanted to throw this picture of this wonderful book written by Stephen Marshall at the University of Guelph, and he's actually done some other works, sort of general insects of North America, as well as flies, um, the fly group. I highly recommend them. They're beautifully written books with fantastic photographs that can really help you out from a scouting standpoint, and they're just, just generally fun to read. So that's my promo for this, uh, this great resource. The immatures of Coleoptera are often referred to as grubs, larvae, and wire worms. So I talked about larval forms before. So here is a, a picture on the left of a grub that's all curled up. You can see it's got really well-developed head, capsule, and legs. Um, to the right of it is this brown, long, hard-looking thing. Those are wire worms. Um, in the bottom picture is a weevil. It's got a very well-developed head, but you really don't see any, any legs. They're just not mobile. They feed with they feed in the plant material and they don't move around a lot. So you do see a lot of variability um, in uh, the beetle group. So the next group, and it's another large group, are the Lepidoptera, the moths and the butterflies. Most of the species within, these, within this order are plant feeders, although there are some interesting variations and some are actually uh, carnivores. The adult Lepidoptera have two pairs of wings and I mentioned that the wings are quite scaly. The antenna are usually knobbed, thread-like, or feathery. They have a coiled proboscis, which is siphoning. Uh, so the adults, they, that's how they feed. They, it's like a siphon that they use for sucking up nectar, things like that. And the adults don't cause the injury. It's the larvae that are the damaging stage, and they have chewing mouth parts. Remember in Lepidoptera, the type of development is egg, larva, pupa, and adult. So it is complete development. Lepidoptera larvae are worth uh, talking a little bit more as well. Um, these are the, the typical caterpillars or worms. They're de the destructive stage, so a rem reminder that they do have those chewing mouth parts. They have three pairs of legs on their thorax, so behind the head is the thorax, and you can see those thoracic legs on this picture. They also have what are called these abdominal prolegs that do help in locomotion. And 
there can be two to five uh, pairs of prolegs on the abdomen. And each of those prolegs have what are called these little crochets, so these little hooks on the, on the abdominal prolegs. If you look at the, the face of the insect or the front part of its face, it has a, a Y suture on it. So the prolegs are important because when you are looking at another group, the sawflies, some of the sawfly larvae look a lot like Lepidoptera caterpillar. They also have prolegs on their abdomen, but they have six to nine pairs and they don't have crochets. Flies are another really important um, group, um, particularly from a pest standpoint. Um, although again, within this group, there's a lot of variability. Many of them are, are beneficial as well. But these are insects that uh, have highly variable mouth parts. The adults can have sponging, sucking, or piercing mouth parts. Um, they're really hostilate, which means they collect food in a liquid form. And the antennae can be uh, filiform, stylate, or aristate. And I won't describe all of those, but again, highly variable antenna. The larvae have mandibles or they have mouth hooks, uh, depending on uh, the, the larval form. The diptera adults have one pair of wings. And they also have these little structures called haltiers, which look like little tiny, tiny little wings, which are used for stability and maneuverability. Flies undergo complete development, which means they start out as an egg. They uh, go through several larval stages or instars. They pupate and then they become adult. The larvae of dip diptera are referred to as maggots and they lack true legs. Most of them are soft and they're pale and they develop in moist, nutrient-rich media like water, soil, plant tissues, carrion, dung, and others. There are two general body types, the culiciform, which are larvae that have a head capsule um, that is present with chewing mouth parts. And then there are the vermiform uh, larvae, which are more like the maggots that we think of from an ag pest standpoint. They don't have legs or a distinct head capsule. They often have mouth parts that are reduced or that are only present as mouth hooks. Um, so you'll meet some of those um, later on in this presentation. It's worth talking about fly diversity in terms of uh, the types of roles that, that flies play in ecosystems. One of the ones that I wanted to highlight is the fact that many of them are pollinators. The adults uh, that love to feed on uh, nectar and pollen, um, particularly the surfed flower flies, can be very important pollinators. And we're really just starting to recognize how important they are for pollinating our food crops. There are also biting flies where the females take blood meals. And of course, we're all, if we like to, if we live in Southern Ontario or we travel to Northern Ontario, these are, these are species that we encounter and most of us aren't happy to see them. Then there are the herbivores, which are the larvae that are feeding on plants. And some of the more important groups are the gall midges, the fruit flies, the leaf miners, and the root and seed maggots. There are also scavengers, so larvae that are feeding in carrion and organic matter and dung. And these are things like the drosophilid pomus flies, or also called vinegar flies, crane flies, which you'll find in soil systems, blow flies, um, and uh, various different midges. Now, uh, drosophila is interesting because although it is a scavenger, some species like spotted wing drosophila is a very significant uh, pest of small fruit. Uh, it doesn't feed on rotting fruit, it feeds on fruit that is ripening. And then there are, of course, predators. So adults or larvae that attack other insects. And these are things like robber flies or bee flies, or again, the surfeit flower flies as the, um, the larval stage. So huge diversity in flies. The last order that I'm gonna to cover today in the intro talk are thrips. Thrips have a long, narrow shape to them, and they're really quite small, typically one to two millimeters in size, although some species can get larger. So you really need to have a good microscope in order to be able to do your identification of thrips. And sometimes you will find more than one species, and so you really need to, uh, you need to look at that because uh, management uh, for different species can vary. The adults um, can be wingless, although when they do have wings, they have two pairs of long, narrow uh, wings that, have, that are fringed with these long hairs. Their mouth parts are asymmetrical. They don't actually have a, a right mandible. And it's the damage that they uh, cause is, is the result of their piercing, sucking mouth parts. It also, it really is rasping, rasping type. The eggs are laid in plant tissues like flowers, leaves, stems, and, uh, and the fruit. Um, about 50% of 
thrips are actually fungi feeders. The rest are plant feeders and a few are predators. The eggs get inserted into these soft tissues and when they hatch, uh, it gives the leaves or the fruit a speckled appearance and the degree of speckling corresponds to the number of hatched eggs. The plant leaves can turn pale and they can get silvery in appearance. The injured plants are often twisted, discolored or scarred. Heavy infestations can reduce the ability of plants to photosynthesize and this can reduce yield and they can also spread viruses. Metamorphosis is complex among thrips and it shows a transition between gradual and complete metamorphosis. The larval stage consists of two instars that feed and develop on the leaves, flowers and fruit. The prepupal and pupal stages often complete their development on the ground or in, in growing medium in the case of greenhouses, but pupation can take place on the plant. The pupa is a non-feeding stage during which the wings and other adult structures form. And with, what is, with thrips, what is also interesting is they have what's called haplodiploid reproduction. Female thrips are diploid, whereas males, where they're present, are haploid, being produced from unfertilized eggs. One of the the important take-home messages that I want you to have today is that things don't occur in isolation. You're working in a cropping system. Um, there's the cropping system that you're working in as, as well as the landscape that's around it and there are insects all over the place. Um, and so what I'm hoping to do here is just to give you a little bit of appreciation of how complex systems can be. And apple orchards are probably one of the more complex systems that you will be scouting in just because of the diversity and the abundance. So from an orchard system standpoint, you are looking at all different parts of the tree. You're looking at branches and blossoms and leaves and fruit and the trunk and roots. You may not be spending a lot of time looking at the roots, but it is part of the system. Then there's the soil, the ground cover, the hedgerows, and the semi-natural spaces. And as I've mentioned, there's insects in all of these systems, and you need to be, the scouts who are in those systems need to be looking hard in all of those areas. So this will give you some idea of the diversity that you would encounter in a single crop. So the branches and the shoots and the buds, these are insects that would be present in these regions. So things like scale insects, twig borers, shoot borers, aphids like woolly apple aphid and European red mites. Um, what I've done here in brackets is I've just listed the order that the insect uh, belongs to in brackets. So scale insects, they're, they're homopterans. Um, shoot borers like oriental fruit moth, they're lepidoptera. So if you need to go back and look again, that's what that actually means here. So we're just going to look at some examples here of, of each. Scale insects like San Jose scale are unusual insects with a unique life cycle that makes them difficult to control and manage. Adult females are nearly round and they're located beneath a waxy scale covering about one and a half millimeters in diameter that has a raised nipple in the center of the covering. They remain under their scale coverings their entire lives. The female, scale, the female scales are yellow, wingless and legless and they have a soft globular shape. And this is what you would see if you were to pull off the waxy covering. The females that are living under these waxy coverings give birth to live young that are called crawlers. And these are the really uh, quite a mobile stage um, for San Jose scale and what allows it to, uh, to move around the plant. The male scales have wings, a single pair of wings, and long antenna. The immature San Jose scales go through three stages, crawler, white cap, and black cap. Crawlers are roughly the diameter of the tip of a pin. They're yellow and they have six legs and antenna. They develop to the white cap stage as they become immobile and they secrete a hard white waxy coverings. The black cap stage follows as the waxy coverings turn gray black. San Jose scales spend the winter as partially grown scales where they adhere themselves tightly to the bark. When the sap begins to run in the spring, the scales begin to grow. Male scales come out from under the scale to mate with females. The females give birth to these nymphs or crawlers, and they start to, these crawlers start to suck the sap with their needle-like mouth parts. In several weeks, they molt and they lose their old skins, their legs, and their antenna to become these flattened sacks with these waxy caps, and they remain attached to the tree with their mouth parts. San Jose scales suck sap from branches, leaves, and fruit, and it causes an overall decline in plant vigor growth and yield. If they're not controlled, they can actually kill the plant. And on fruit, you will see um, the feeding causes these slight depressions with these red to purple halos on them. Woolly apple aphid um, are an interesting uh, 
group of aphids that develop these long waxy fibers that give them this whitish mealy kind of appearance, a little bit like cottony tufts. And these waxy fibers do actually uh, protect, help to protect them from uh, some of the natural enemies that would normally be feeding on aphids, um, as well as providing some protection um, from uh, crop uh, protection products. They overwinter as adults in the roots of apple. And in the springtime, the first instar nymphs migrate to the aerial parts of the tree to initiate colonies. Um, their uh, feeding is usually associated with pruning cuts and new growth rather than the leaves themselves. The feeding on these parts of the plant causes the formation of galls on shoots and roots, and it can disrupt the nutrient and water flow. And it can, their feeding can also result in the development of infection sites for the entry of diseases. Um, well, the apple aphid uh, reproduces asexually um, in Ontario. So the female is, uh, is giving birth to uh, to live, to live young. Um, there are several, as with other aphids, there are several um, natural enemies that will go after it. In particular here, um, Aphelinus mali, which is a parasitic wasp, uh, can really help to reduce the numbers of this pest. European red mite is my representative mite that I'll be talking about during this presentation. I'm sure you'll hear more about this species as well as others in numerous other crops um, that you're scouting in. Um, red mites are really tiny. They're microscopic. In fact, the adults are less than 0.4 millimeters in size. They overwinter as eggs on the bark and buds and fruiting spurs. And they will start to hatch out when conditions become favorable in the springtime. The eggs themselves are red, they're slightly flattened and onion shaped, and they have a hair like stalk that protrudes from the top. Unfortunately, I don't have a great picture of that, but uh, they're, they're quite, um, quite distinct. Um, the uh, adults and the nymphs of the red mite will feed on the leaves, and their feeding causes a condition that looks like bronzing. So the leaves take on a color that's not, um, that's not nice and bright uh, green. Their feeding will reduce shoot growth uh, as well as fruit bud development. It will uh, reduce the fruit color, soluble uh, solids, firmness, size, and weight of the fruit. And this is when the numbers are really high. And this is one of the things with European red mite. With, with this pest, it's not just a question of whether it's present or not. It's, it's how many, which is the case with a lot of insects. In the case of European red mite, depending on the time of year, you can tolerate higher numbers or lower numbers on the leaves where they're feeding. So you do need to be able to count them, which means that you need a good hand lens or a microscope so that you can uh, provide accurate information and know whether or not you've reached a threshold. And you're going to be looking for all um, active life stages, especially uh, during in-season, um, the nymphs and the adults that are feeding. And you're also going to be looking for uh, predatory mite species that are also very common in apple orchards. Um, then we move on to the trunk of the apple. Um, and there's a few pests that I've highlighted here, the clear wing borers, ambrosia bark beetles, and the round-headed apple borers. And I'm going to talk about the clear wing moth borer here in this case. This is uh, from the family Saseidae, apple clear wing moth. And these are day-flying moths. You can see their moths are, their wings are actually clear. Um, the female of th these species lay their eggs under the bark of tree at weak points, and the larvae when they hatch out from their eggs, they feed on the cambium and eventually, or underneath the bark, and eventually that girdles the tree. And you may actually see frass uh, from that feeding that's evident. That's that second picture there. Um, eventually, they complete their development. It can take it can take more than one year, um, but usually there's one generation per year. The they kind of crawl out to the surface of the the bark and they pupate, and you'll often see that pupil case visible on the bark. Um, the small or spindle trees, the high density trees, which are being grown more and more, are really at high risk of injury. And these are monitored using pheromone traps. Again, we'll get to pheromone traps in another presentation. Then you have insects that are associated with blossoms. And these, um, of course, we think about pollinators like bees and surfeit flies, but also butterflies and others um, are important pollinators. Um, we can also see that uh, when apple is in bloom, it's also at risk for European apple softfly, which is a hymenoptera, as well as rosy apple aphid, which is another homoptera. 
So from the standpoint of bees, we're pretty familiar with things like bumblebees and honeybees, but did you know that we have um, native bees here, particularly from the family Andrenidae or mining bees that are incredibly important wild pollinators um, in apple systems. Um, so they, uh, some of them are actually apple specialists and they're active early in the season. They're also solitary bees. So they, what that means is that it's a single female that um, basically establishes her nest, that lays her eggs, that forages food for her progeny. Um, and um, so she doesn't have sisters to help her out. So they're solitary ground nesters. They lay or they develop these underground cells for their nests and each cell within the nest has an individual egg and the female provisions it with pollen and nectar balls. And so typically one generation per year, um, and so the babies never get to see their mother. Um, they emerge the following year. You're not monitoring for those, but, uh, but you'll probably see them. Then you have a pest, like European apple sawfly, which is introduced. Um, it is also active around bloom, which makes it really challenging to control because the female is laying her eggs during a time where it's, we're really not supposed to be spraying uh, insecticides. There is a legislation that prevents that. Um, the female um, is quite a, she's, she's got quite a thick waist um, and she has this jackknife like saw on the ovipositor that unfortunately I don't have a great picture of, but picture a saw on her ovipositor. And she, um, she will use that to saw into plant tissues and lay her eggs. The larvae are caterpillar-like. Um, remember they're saw flies, so they do have prolegs, but they don't have crochet or those hooks on their prolegs. And they will feed on those developing fruitlets. And for fruit that doesn't fall to the ground, you have these characteristic scars that are left behind at harvest. European apple sawfly is uh, monitored um, using these um, white um, vein type traps. There are numerous insects that will feed on the leaves of apple trees. What's interesting with these leaf feeders is that they are not uh, consuming portions of the plant that are being harvested. So they're not feeding on the fruit themselves. However, um, the injury that they cause, which is called indirect injury, um, can cause significant decreases in crop quality and in yield, and can also affect the, the vigor of the tree, especially during years of establishment. So there's a number of different pests that you'll see, and we're only gonna cover a few of them briefly, things like aphids, leafhoppers, mullein bugs, and Japanese beetles. But of course, you can see that there's quite a number of, uh, of pests that are present here. Rosy apple aphid is a great example of an aphid species that feeds in the leaves. And actually in apple, this insect will form very, very large colonies in the leaves. If you look at the top left picture and the one below it, you'll see that there can be hundreds of individuals within a single colony under a leaf. And that, what you might find if you're looking at uh, that colony is you might find cast skins from molts, you might find uh, nymphs of varying stages, and you might find adults that are either winged or without wings. One of the other things with aphids that you can see with rosy apple aphid is that they have these cornicles or tailpipes at the back end of their abdomen. Look for those features when you're looking um, at leaves because there are some other small insects like mullein bug or leaf hoppers that are also kind of small and about the same kind of size. One of the things with rosy apple aphid is that it has a toxic saliva. And when this insect is feeding, it causes severe leaf curling. So it's not unusual for aphid colonies to result in curling of, of leafy tissue, but it is quite extreme with rosy apple aphid. In addition, their feeding can result in the development of small and deformed fruit. And of course, like other aphids, they produce lots of honeydew. Potato leafhopper is another um, leaf feeding insect on apples. It's uh, part of the family Cicadellidae. Um, sometimes the nymphs are confused with aphids, although they're really different. Um, they're wedge shaped for one thing, um, but they also move very quickly. Aphids don't move very fast, but uh, leafhoppers do. The adults hold their wings uh, tent-like over their body. Remember that's characteristic of this group. They also have these cast skins that you will see um, in under leaves if you look. If you look, 
And they will have they will also inject a toxin that causes that leaf rolling and another condition called hopper burn. So it doesn't take very many potato leaf hopper to actually cause that, only usually two or three perhaps per leaf, and you'll get this curling that occurs that you can start to see the discoloration in that middle picture. And then on the bottom picture, you'll see those little blackened tips, and that's that's hopper burn. Um, other leaf hopper species in apple, like the apple leaf hopper, white apple leaf hopper, um, it takes many more um, leaf hoppers to actually cause that sort of damage to leaves and they they don't cause that hopper burn they they cause kind of a stippling so even though you have two different leaf hop leaf hoppers on apple you'd think the damage looks similar but in fact it, it doesn't potato leaf hopper is also an interesting one because it has many many host species that it will feed on um, and it's another one that doesn't overwinter here. It migrates uh, northward yearly, and it's it's hard to predict when it will arrive. Some years are bad for it, it shows up early, and others not so much. Mullen bug is a friend and a foe in apple, depending on the time of year and the development of the plant. So this is um, uh, uh, one of our bugs, right? So it's a uh, heteroptera. And the adults and the nymphs, again, have a, a similar, kind of similar appearance, although there's coloration, a little coloration differences. They both have piercing, sucking mouth parts. They are important predators of mites and aphids, um, eggs of different insects, all sorts of things. In the middle, you can see there's a nymph with its little wing pads feeding on a, on a scylla, pear scylla in this case. Um, but they can be a pest early in the season in apple usually until two to three weeks after petal fall. And the reason is, is that it takes time for the things that they feed on to build up on apples. Um, so until their prey are present in abundance, they will also plant feed and that can cause injury in the apple. So friend and foe. Um, Japanese beetle is a pest you're gonna see in a whole bunch of different crops. Um, the adults are, uh, they feed on all sorts of different landscape plants um, and crops. Um, the adults and the larvae have chewing mouth parts. The adults are present sort of on the aerial parts of plants. So they're leaf feeders, they skeletonize um, tissue. Basically they chew everything that isn't the mid vein. And um, so you get these leafy, the sort of lacy looking leaves from their feeding and you find them in large numbers. They will aggregate. Um, and the females will lay their eggs in the soil, especially grassy areas. So the larvae will feed on the roots of plants um, they can be really quite damaging in their, in their own right, but also because you'll have things like skunks, which will dig them up and leave big holes in turf, which people don't like. Um, but uh, so it's sort of, but they both have chewing mouth parts, both the, the, the immatures and the adults. So here's, the, here's one that you might see in an apple system um, as well. The, you'll see them in many other crops as well. Then we get to the fruit, which is of course the part of the plant that the grower is going to harvest. Um, there's a new number of different pests to worry about here. You've met some of them already, like European apple sawfly, but there's also apple maggots, oriental fruit moth and codling moth, leaf rollers, those are a lepidoptera, plum curculio, which is a coleoptera, stink bugs, heteroptera, tarnished plant bug, and mullen bug, who you've already met. Apple maggot is a really serious uh, fruit pest. In fact, it's from a family, the Tifridae or fruit flies. They are um, problematic pests in, in many of the crops that we produce here. Blueberry maggot is, is uh, related to it. European cherry fruit fly, cherry fruit fly, they're all from that family. The wing patterns of these flies is really helpful from an ID standpoint. So these are monitored um, using yellow sticky cards and, um, and baits. Um, and they do attract a lot of different insects, including related species. So it's important to look at the patterns on the wings. The female will lay the eggs under the skin of the apple and the little larvae or, mag or maggots will tunnel in the, in the flesh of the fruit. Remember that they're, dip they're diptera larvae and these particular maggots are legless. They're tapered and they have these dark mouth hooks, hooks which are present as you can see in the bottom picture there. Stink bugs are from the family Pentatomidae. They're shield shaped as adults and they have five segmented antenna. I haven't talked about antenna a lot, but it's actually quite an important feature to look at um, when you're looking at families of insects. They have this large triangular structure called a scutellum. You can see it on the back of that stink bug. They have a pronotum, which is that sort of the shoulder areas of the 
of the bug, which have these kind of um, bumps or spines sometimes, depending on the species. Um, they can be predatory and they can be plant feeders. It really depends on the species. We have something like 56 species of stink bugs in Ontario, and most of them are not pests, or many of them are not pests. The eggs of stink bugs are barrel shaped, and they are in clusters, usually of 20 to 25, 30. When those stink bugs hatch out, it's like a synchronous hatch, and they hang out on the egg mass, um, feeding on whatever's left in the eggs, and then they disperse after that. They have these piercing sucking mouth parts. And um, remember, there's both friends and foes stink bugs. So the friend stink bugs have these thick, short um, mouth parts. They're very strong. They're good for piercing things, other insects. And the plant feeders have these sort of long thread-like needle, needle-like um, mouth parts. So that's actually a really easy way to tell them apart. Although the plant feeders, the, the beak um, is sort of more attached to the head, whereas in predators, it's much more flexible. And this is the kind of injury that you'll see in fruit from stink bugs, um, piercing sucking. So they'll feed um, on the tissues underneath the skin. The tissues will collapse. They'll get corky and brown. And that's obviously not something that the grower can see. Plum curculio is a member of the weevil family, or curculionidae. The species within this group have these very interesting snouts to them. If you look at the picture on the top uh, left hand side, you will see that snout is sticking out from the front of the head and you'll also see the antenna that are attached to it. Um, in some, uh, some individuals or some species, that snout can be really, really long or it might be reduced depending on who you're looking at. One of the things that's interesting with plum curculio is it's an example of an insect that does not overwinter within the orchard typically. It will usually migrate from protected areas in the springtime when conditions become favorable. Both the adult and the larva have chewing mouth parts. The adult can feed on the blossoms and on the developing fruit. The female lays her eggs within the, the, the developing fruit singly. So if you look at the bottom uh, left, you'll see a little crescent scar, and that's the scar, overposition scar, that's been left behind. The larvae will tunnel in the fruit and, of course, render it unmarketable, or the fruit will drop to the ground. The picture that you see in the middle is a feeding of plum curculio actually on uh, cherries, and that's actual feeding damage from the, from the adults. The larvae, when they uh, complete their development, uh, will fall to the ground and they will pupate in the soil. Oblique banded leaf roller is another Lepidoptera from the family Tortricidae. It's another very important family of Lepidoptera affecting fruit. The female will lay her eggs in masses um, on the leaves and they hatch, the eggs hatch out. The larvae um, have these chewing mouth parts. Again, they're Lepidoptera, they have chewing mouth parts. They will feed on the developing leaf and flower buds, and on um, they will also feed on this, the epidermis of the fruit. So especially where the fruit comes in contact, um, the fruitlets come in contact with one another, or if there's a leaf over the fruit. The picture that I have here is actually on plum. It is a leaf roller. It's it is a leaf roller. It's got a leaf that it's uh, basically sewed to the side of the fruit with some webbing and it's feeding protected. I've pulled its protection off. So these species will attack um, other things apart from apples as well. And they have a pretty large host range. So that's kind of a, an introduction of what you would see on one crop. Um, and we've only covered a few of the pests. Think as well of all of the different things that are in the ground cover and the border areas, things like tarnished plant bug and other pests you're going to learn about for sure, predatory ground beetles, two-spot spider mites that are overwintering, lady beetles, parasitic wasps, lots and lots of other insects. So it's a really, really complex uh, system and uh, scouting can be challenging, but uh, you'll get through it. Thank you for attending the presentation on Intro to Entomology for IPM Scout Training. I do hope that some of the information that you've uh, learned today can be applied in some of the future training that you will be uh, undertaking this year, as well as any of your field work. And my contact information is provided below. If you need to send me an email, uh, look forward to hearing from you. Thanks very much.